There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Joe. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Hello! Well, a brother recently told me that he is going through the book of Job, and that kind of inspired me to start a series on the book of Job. Uh, there is so much to learn in the book of Job, and um, there are lots of parts of it that might be hard to understand. I've only been through the book completely through it a couple of times, um, so I have a lot to learn about it myself, and there's no way we could, uh, you know, learn everything in one study. And uh, so, I, I hope that this will just be the beginning of a series on the book of Job and this is just kind of an introduction or a beginning to that and this is just going to be like a general study and I want to go over seven practical lessons that we can learn in the book of Job. Um, we can learn many things in the book of Job. We can learn of God's power, wisdom, the sovereignty, uh, God's sovereignty in the world. We can see how men of God grappled with the question of God's justice. We can observe that God does take notice of the righteous, the righteous and um, the book of Job also provides an answer to the challenge made by Satan. Uh, there are people who will serve God, even in adversity, for God is worthy of our praise apart from the blessings He provides. May, may we be such people. Uh, that doesn't mean that we won't have questions for which answers can't be found in this life, but with the book of Job, we can learn how the righteous should suffer, how careful we should be in comforting the suffering, and to accept the fact that we can never fully comprehend God's working in our lives and in the world. So, some key words that might come to mind when we think about the book of Job would be suffering, trial, perseverance, or the sovereignty of God. Um, some key chapters in the book of Job would be the first chapter. Chapter 1, uh, we see the plot unfolding with Satan tempting Job. And at the end of chapter 42, we see that Job endures the suffering and uh, everything is restored by God. And uh, it's just a great ending to this book. And you know, the book of Job is thought by many people to, to be their favorite book. Um, I think that the central message in the book of Job, uh, a lot of people might think is suffering, which is a big part of it, but uh, the central message really is, will a man serve God for nothing? Uh, that's basically what Satan uh, says to God in Job chapter 1 verse 9. Uh, then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? So basically, is, is righteous living, is righteousness um, apart from all the blessings possible? Okay, if everything was taken away from Job, would he still fear God? Would he still serve God? Would he still praise God? And in the end, we find out the answer to that is yes, God can be served because of who he is, because of his goodness and his mercy and his kindness. And so, I want to look at seven practical lessons that we can learn from the book of Job. And the first one is going to be that we have an aggressive enemy. And we should all know who that is. That is the serpent, the great dragon, the devil, Satan. And uh, we learn in Job chapter 1 verse 6, uh, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And I've said in another study, the sons of God, the daughters of men, that the sons of God were men, not angels. And they're presenting themselves before the Lord on earth, like many other verses say, that, that men of God presented themselves before the Lord. So when the sons of God, men, came to present themselves before the Lord, and probably Job was among them at this time, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And then Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. 
And then a lot of people look at that and they say, well, Satan said he was going to and fro from the earth, so they that that are in the earth, so that must mean that at, at this point he's talking to God, he's not on the earth, but that doesn't have to mean that at all. So that's just people trying to make the verse say what they want to say. Um, anyways, what was Satan doing when he was walking up and down in the earth? Uh, well, he was looking for men and women to tempt. Uh, Satan isn't wasting any time. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Satan instigates, he instigates men to sin. He tempts men. He allures the saints. He even tempted Christ. Uh, imagine that. Um, he slanders God to man. He slanders man to God. He inflicts suffering and disease. He enters into and controls men. He contends with and opposes the saints. He sifts and tries believers. He binds the minds of unbelievers. He steals away the truth from the minds of men. He, tows, he sows tares or counterfeit doctrine and has counterfeit children. He authorized and energized his own ministers into angels of light. He institutes his own churches and religious systems called synagogues of Satan. He seeks to destroy men. He is the father of all lies. He deceives the nations. We need to resist Satan. What a horrible being Satan is. Uh, all of these things that he does and, and more. Uh, but we as Christians, we need to resist Satan, and this resistance is best accomplished by submitting to God. Romans chapter 6, verses 17 through 19 says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered, delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to, iniqu and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and unto holiness. So yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. Submit to God. Resist the devil. And uh, resistance is also accomplished by putting on the whole armor of God, which we read about in Ephesians chapter 6, verse, starting in verse 10. And so uh, that first point there was that we have an aggressive enemy. And uh, there is so much to learn about Satan. If you go to my website, acceptyoubeconverted.com, go to Sound Doctrine, go to Created Beings, and you'll see Satan there, and there's already a, a list of pages there, and you can learn a whole lot about Satan, and I'll be doing more studies on him in the future. And there is a lot to learn about Satan just from the book of Job, and uh, that is a study that I plan on doing in the near future. So the first uh, practical lesson is that we have an aggressive enemy, and let's look at the second practical lesson, which is sometimes the Lord does give and the Lord does take away. In Job chapter 1, verse 21, it says, uh, Job said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so we need to be grateful and thankful for the blessings that we currently have and the blessings that we have had in the past. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And we need to not trust in the riches of this world. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7 says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, Jesus said, Lay not up yourselves treasure upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. So the second practical lesson that we learned is sometimes... The Lord does give and the Lord does take away. And Job certainly learned that. So 
The third practical lesson that we're going to look at is suffering produces endurance. Uh, James spoke about Job in James chapter 5 verse 11. James said, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So, the patience of Job or the endurance of Job. We count them happy which endure. Suffering produces endurance. In Romans chapter 5 verse 3, Paul said, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience or endurance. Now, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says, My brethren, encounter all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. All Christians will suffer. This is something that we must realize. And, and why do we suffer? Well, for one, Satan and sin causes suffering. Satan was the active force behind all of Job's suffering. Uh, we will suffer for righteousness. Acts 14 verse 22 says, Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much, tribu much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Through much tribulation. And 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We also may suffer as a means of purification. Psalms 119 verse 67 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Because I was afflicted, uh, that's why he kept the word. So Psalm 119.71 says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And suffering causes us to look forward to heaven. Romans 8 verse 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Why did Job suffer? Well, Job, uh, Job did not suffer because he was a bad person. Um, you know, it wasn't because, you know, he was constantly sinning against God all the time because Job 1 verse 1 we see that he was a he he was it says he was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil okay so he obeyed God he uh, he followed God and but Job is never told why he is suffering instead he is told who to trust in so the who is much more important than the why, and it's very important that we realize that. So the third practical lesson is that suffering produces endurance. And the next uh, is that God's word is of most importance. Job 23 verse 12 says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And um, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. Are we hungry for the word of God? God's word is our guide for righteousness. Psalms 119.105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalms 119 verses 10 and 11, With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. God's word is also likened to a sword that we can use to combat the enemy. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is, is, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Jesus used the word of God against Satan. At Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus said uh, to Satan, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word 
that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And what's interesting is in the corrupt Bible versions, and a lot of them, they'll remove uh, the second part, half of that. Um, they'll just say, man shall not live by bread alone, but then they remove the every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, which is interesting because, you know, the corrupt versions don't have every word, uh, you know, of the Bible. So... We need to uh, trust God's word even in dark times. So uh, that practical lesson uh, was that God's word is of most importance. And we need to, no matter what, trust God. Job chapter 13 verse 15 says, Though he slay me, Yet will I trust him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. Job had faith in the Lord. And I find it's really uh, absurd that people teach that Old Testament saints were saved by keeping the law. And, and they'll say, well, you know, nobody really had faith back then. If you look up the words faith and believe, you'll only find them, you know, a couple times in the Old Testament. Not very many times. So... Uh, so just because you don't see the word faith or the word believe, nobody had faith in the Old Testament. It's absolutely absurd. It's very clear that Job had faith in the Lord. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Okay, trusting in the Lord is having faith in the Lord. And so, uh, you know, nobody was saved by, by offering sacrifices to the Lord. Okay. Nobody sacrificed, uh, you know, if somebody sacrificed offerings to the Lord, they had faith in God. If they offered sac sacrifices to the Lord without faith, then those sacrifices were an abomination to God. So faith is always what comes first. We are saved by grace through faith, and it's always been the same. And many, many people in the Old Testament had faith in God. Just because the words believe or faith are not there does not mean that. Okay, A lot of times it says people trusted in the Lord, they called on the Lord, etc., etc., they certainly had faith. And so Job trusted in God no matter what, and that's what we need to do. Job chapter 19, verse 25, Job said, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. We can know that we can trust God because he is faithful. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 says, Let your conversation be without covetous, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So it's very important that we realize, those of us who are saved, that the Lord will never forsake us. In Matthew 28, 20, Jesus told his disciples, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And um, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine understanding. So no matter what, trust God. That is that practical lesson. And there's a couple more here. Uh, so, practical lesson number six is life is so brief. Uh, this life is short. Job says, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. In Job chapter 7 verse 6, and we, can, we cannot stop time or even slow it down. Job continues to say, man that is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth, uh, he fleeth also as a shadow, and continueth not. Job chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. God's word says also in Psalms 90, verses 10 through 12, The days of our years are threescore years and ten, but if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off. And we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Second Samuel chapter 14, verse 14 says, For we must needs die, and, at, and are as water split, spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person, yet doth he devise means that he banished 
be not expelled, that his banish be not expelled from him. Psalm chapter 144 verse 4 says, Man is like to vanity, his days are as a shadow that passeth away. And James chapter 4 verses 13 through 15 says, Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell, and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth at for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. This life is short. It is temporary. Many people put off becoming a Christian because they are too busy with their worldly pursuits. Um, let's see here. Okay. Okay. Um, well, life is short. Job realized that life was brief, but he still trusted in the Almighty. So let's make sure that our priorities are where they need to be. Because the final practical lesson that we can learn from the book of Job is that there is life beyond the grave. Job chapter 14, verse 14, If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. After this life we will enter, we will either go to a place of blessing or a place of suffering. John chapter 5 verse 28 and 29 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Many people put off becoming a Christian because they are too busy with their worldly pursuits. But car wrecks, plane, plane, cars wreck, planes crash, people die every day of strokes and heart attacks, and without warning the vapor of life quickly disappears. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed once, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Every day we live, we are one day closer to death and eternity. We are not promised tomorrow. Tomorrow is only a hope. People can hide their fear of dying and cover it up with the pursuit of material success. But Matthew 16, 26, Jesus said, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Our soul is priceless. Many people put off becoming a Christian. Some may delay their repentance until they think they can get everything just right before they obey the Lord. They seem to think they will live forever on this earth. In, taking, in, ta in talking to people about their soul, many respond by saying, I am not ready yet. The problem is there is, no, there is not much time to get ready. Um, they will soon run out of time. It will be too late then. We must get it right while we have time. There will be no second chances. No one will accidentally go to heaven. In less than 100 years from now, we will all be dead. We will either be with the many being tormented in hell, or with the few in the glory of heaven. And we, we make the choice in this life as to which place we will be. Let's make the right choice. So, friend, watching this, have you prepared for eternity? Uh, how can you avoid this place of suffering? Well, Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you trusted in Him for your salvation? Um, have you trusted in the right Jesus, the one who was born of a virgin, the one who uh, created the world, the one who, um, you know, has existed from everlasting to everlasting, okay? The one who is the second person of a triune God. Um, have you put your faith in Him, the one who died for your sins and rose again on the third day, the one who was crucified? Have you trusted in that Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ of the Holy Bible, that He died for your sins? Do you have faith in Him? 
Um, now, there are millions and millions of people who profess the name of Christ. They say that they believe in Christ. But when I ask, do you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? It means more than just an intellectual knowledge that Jesus is God or that there is a God. Have you been born again? Is your life changed? Have you become a new creature in Christ? Have you submitted to Him as Lord? That is very important because in Luke 19, verse 27, Jesus said, uh, well, Jesus said, but those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Okay, so there will not be anyone who will be in heaven who has not submitted to the Lord, who has not allowed him to reign over them. Okay, Jesus said, those, but those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. If, if you have not if you do not want Christ to reign over you as Lord then you have not submitted to him then you truly don't have a faith that will save you and in Acts 16 verse 31 someone asked what must I do to be saved and the answer was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house and a lot of people put the emphasis on believe and they make that belief into a mere intellectual knowledge without repentance of sins without submitting to the Lord but the real focus in this passage is the Lord believe on the Lord Jesus Christ you must submit to Jesus Christ as Lord and if you do that then you can trust that you are saved and you will not go to that that horrible place in the next life of eternal suffering but you will be with the Lord Jesus Christ and all of his saints so I pray that if you haven't trusted in the Lord as your Savior if you haven't repented of your sins turn to him uh, that you will be saved today and don't wait any longer because life is short so let's look over these um, seven practical lessons again the first one is that we have an aggressive enemy and uh, the second one is sometimes the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. The third one is suffering produces endurance. And the fourth one is God's word is of most importance. The fifth one is no matter what, trust God. The sixth one is life is so brief. And the seventh practical lesson that we learn from the book of Job is that there is life beyond the grave. And let's make sure that we know where we're headed. Uh, so, there is so much to learn about the book of Job, so much to understand, and um, there's a lot of things to learn about God, there's things to learn about Satan, there's things to learn about suffering, there's things to learn about friendship, you know, um, usually Job is considered as one of the books of wisdom, like along with Proverbs and some of the others, so there's just so much to learn, there's a whole lot of dialogue, there's a lot of figures of speech used, and um, so I want to just, you know, until whenever just continue studying the book of Job and I'm going to break it down piece by piece by piece by piece and we're going to look at all these different topics and uh, so there's a lot to learn and this is so this is just the beginning and uh, hope that you learned something today and look forward to more studies on the book of Job and more studies on many other subjects and please visit my website acceptyoubeconverted.com go to the sound doctrine section which I'm working on daily and there's a lot of pages there in detail really um, you know immense studies uh, lots and lots of scripture and uh, there's comment sections so you can leave your comments if there's something that you like or don't like on there feel free to comment feel free to contact me you can see my Twitter on there you know I got my email you can send a prayer request um, you know there's even a chat on there I might be on there you can chat with me live on there um, you know comment on my YouTube videos subscribe um, so Thanks for watching, and God bless. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, 
ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven.